Good evening, everybody, and good to see you once again. And especially to our speaker, Ian Puddick, who has come all the way from London to give his talk. Um, how many of you here, before I start, are familiar with, with my story, with my experience? I've seen it on the internet, just read about it in the newspapers, been debated in Parliament. A few, a few of you, a few of you. Um, I'll try and give you um, a, run, a very brief rundown, a resume, to sort of explain how it all started, how I ended up being repeatedly um, raided, arrested by the City of London Counterterrorism Squad. Um, what, 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 what they charged me with, the reasons why, um, the fact that they've spent millions trying to prosecute me to get me into court. If I was just to tell you now instantly, I promise you none of you would believe me. You just wouldn't. You'd say, no way. There is absolutely... <laughs> okay, okay. It is so incredible. And the fact that, you know, obviously being arrested constantly by the, the counter-terrorism directorate, <laughs> Uh, without being too smug, I generally don't fit the perception, rightly or wrongly, of the kind of guy, I'm a plumber, that would be repeatedly raided by City of London Counterterrorism Directorate, apart from our little friend there who deserves it, obviously. <laughs> so thanks, Chris. Um, but, yeah, I'll, 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 um, I'll start, I'll, I'll try and explain very briefly how it all started. In 2009, um, I found out my wife was having an affair. And let's be really frank, these things happen. Obviously at the time I wasn't as pragmatic, I was deeply upset, but these things happen and they always will. Um, trying to resolve the issue, I rang up the chap who was a very, very influential chap in the city. And I rang him up and asked for my wife to be moved and um, he wasn't gonna do that. So um, I rang up the chairman of the company and very politely said, look, we've got this problem. I'd like my wife to be, uh, to be moved. She was working as his as his secretary, so we can sort this nonsense out. Not an unreasonable request. The, the chap that she'd had the affair with was um, the European CEO of, of the world's largest reinsurance company. Now, by me ringing up his boss, the chairman, and asking for him to be moved, not unreasonably in my, in my experience or in my opinion, um, he felt that that could damage his reputation. So he went to the police and he reported me for, for making the allegation of an affair. You couldn't make it up. You couldn't make it up. Sur Surrey, uh, Sussex police wisely looked at the situation and confirmed in writing that it was not a criminal matter and that if they did pursue it, he probably wouldn't turn up in court because as a, C as a CEO business leader, of the world's largest reinsurance company, a company called Guy Carpenter Limited, he had a lot to lose. It all became very public. Think of Ryan Giggs and all these celebrities that have super injunctions, and the minute it comes out, it spreads even more than it probably would normally for the simple reason that people want to, to get the inside news, to see, find out what the secrets are. So they confirmed in writing that it was a civil matter, not a criminal matter, and they declined to get involved. This is where it gets very, very sinister. Now, None of you obviously know me, and I will make jokes through, the, through, through this. Not jokes because I want to be funny, but that's just my, my way of dealing with things, if that makes sense. I'm not here to... This is a very, very serious subject, and I'd like to smile because it's so much easier than being miserable and, and upset. So what, um, what, what then happened was this chap used his influence in the city of London and went to a company called Kroll, I don't know if anyone here is familiar with a company called Kroll, quite a few of you. Um, Kroll are the world's biggest private security company. Now Kroll confirmed, and this is where it gets, starts to get a bit darker, Kroll confirmed in writing that Sussex police had said it was a civil matter, however, they had contacts at the City of London Police, at very senior level, they had contacts, because their head of security at Kroll, the security company, was ex-City of London Police, and they confirmed in writing that their head of security, Dan Mead, was going to go and meet Detective, Superint Detective Superintendent uh, Davis and Detective Chief Inspector Chandler. So Kroll, the private security, meet, uh, meet, meet the City of London Police. And the City of London Police confirm in writing that they can use the Counter-Terrorism Act to raid me. The Counter-Terrorism, I said I'm a plumber, I, I run a small company, I employ people. 
um, and they would put considerable resources. The managing director of Kroll then rings me, and obviously I'm not going to use any foul language, and says that he's going to F me like I've never been F'd before and that they have very, very deep pockets. Just after that, my house is raided by the counter-terrorism director. My company, the plumbing company, has got nothing to do with this affair whatsoever. Um, they're raided by the counter-terrorism director. And my company accountants, that are certainly not involved in any of this nonsense, they're raided by the counter-terrorism director in something called Operation Bohan. Um, the documents that I was able to get under the Freedom of Information request, and also largely from the CPS, um, disclosed that I've been under major surveillance for a very, very long time. Um, and basically, it all culminated in this big, huge dawn raid on my home, on my company, and on my accountants, all because of an affair. Now, obviously, I've never been in trouble before. I think of anyone that's seen me on the internet, I do say I'm guilty of a few parking offences. Uh, one or two. Uh, <laughs> um, well, I think it might be, what will I say, one or two? Um, then, um, obviously, I'm raided. I'm, I'm taken away. Never been in trouble before. Um, police are very nice to me, so at that, at that moment in time. Police are very nice to me. Um, and, obviously, I was terrified, to be really frank. Re absolutely terrified. So, in the police car in the morning, uh, while, the, while I'm being taken, taken away, um, I told the police everything in the car, as you would expect. But nothing, I've, I don't, at this point, I don't see how I've done anything majorly wrong. And as far as I'm concerned, this huge raid was just, I don't know, I didn't know what it was. So get to the police station. Um, I am cautioned. And um, the police officers say, right, I declined a solicitor, by the way. I've never you know, declined a solicitor. I didn't feel I've done anything wrong. I don't need a solicitor to tell me what I can and can't say. If you've got nothing to hide. At that time, I believe that if you tell the truth, It'll be fine. So I explain the circumstances in very much the same way that I have done with you. That's it. I'm taken out. Um, I'm, I'm in the cell. Oh, they left me in the cells all day. They, they took me home that evening. I then have to go back a week later. Uh, sorry, four weeks later. And they take me to uh, another high security police station. And uh, I'm then charged with non-violent harassment for making the phone calls. And obviously I've given a full confession that I've made the phone calls. So there's no dispute about anything. This is when it gets sinister again. Detective Sergeant John Ellis says, we need to re-interview you. So I said, okay. They took me through the station. They took me through to a, an interview room. And in, and in that room, I'm brutalized. I'm brutalized by, I'm a big fella, but I'm a complete wimp. Um, I'm brutalised by John Ellis. He says that we've got the forensics back because when they raided me on that big day, they took everything, from, they took all my computers from my office, from my home, my phone, my digital camera, my satellite navigation system. And he says that we've got forensics of you taking cocaine. We've got photographs of you taking cocaine. And I said, well, that's really, really easy to explain because I've never seen cocaine. So there's no photographs of me. They don't exist because I've never seen them. So I demand to see the photographs. Now remember, there's no record of this interview. I'm not being cautioned. There's no tape recordings. There's none, none of the police formalities that they have to adhere to. So he starts effing and blinding and starts threatening me. So he said, you must have done cocaine when you were at, at university. And I said, well, I've been to a university, obviously, but I didn't go to university. When I left school, I worked for the council as a plumber, did a plum plumbing apprenticeship. So um, anyway, he got progressively and progressively more, more angry. Um, the interview didn't get anywhere because obviously I was demanding to see the picture. And in the end, he, he said that the picture didn't exist. I um, put a complaint into the IPCC. I have to say I was warned by so many people. I really didn't know. I was warned by so many people that they will cover it up and, and all the rest of it. But anyway... They did. The CCTV all got wiped. Um, when when the, the IPCC officer um, who worked with the officers rang me, Craig Mullish, and said, um, he said, can you describe the two officers? I'm a bit concerned. I want to make sure that we're talking about the same, same two officers that took you through to that room. They, um, the officers don't deny taking me through to that room and interviewing me. They can't remember. They made no notes. There's no records. And it was only a friendly officer who was appalled at what they'd done actually contacted me and said, tell, tell the IPCC 
to check the door locks. So there's me, a plumber, contacting Craig Malish, sending him, I sent, made a phone call and I thought I'd better back it up with an email because he'll deny I did it. So I sent, him email, I sent him an email saying, check the door locks because they will show that they were accessed by those officers, taking me through to the interview room. Obviously there'll be a, 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 tw a 15 minute delay while they interview me and then obviously the doors will be exited again. So the officer checks them, obviously they correspond. And now the officers do remember taking me through to that room. In fact, they asked, they actually say that I wanted to go through to, I didn't even that room existed. <laughs> um, and they, and they, uh, they just come out with a pack of lies. And I was so angry that I hadn't hurt anybody. I hadn't threatened anybody. I'm a very, very peaceful man. I'm not violent at all that they could brutalise me, screaming in my face, calling me an F in this, that and the other, for, for an affair, for an affair. I was so angry and I thought if they could do that to me, because I'm not the kind of bloke that generally has all this kind of nonsense, if they could do that to me, they could do that to, to anybody. And obviously I got to speak to people and, and I started to make a fuss about it, I don't think unreasonably. And some friendly police officers said, look, you know, that, that officer that did that, he's done it before. You wouldn't have an officer that's never behaved like that, like that in his life and has suddenly behaved like that. That would be part of his behaviour. That would be a, normal, a normalised behaviour. And I thought, I'm not going to let these guys get away with it. So we get to my first court hearing. And in my first court hearing, there's uh, pages and pages of bail conditions against me. And at my first court hearing, the, um, the case has to be adjourned because the, pap the paperwork in the court isn't there. It's been lost. It's been mis mislaid. So this, another officer, a counter-terrorism officer, stands up in court. The magistrate says, what's this all about? And the, um, the, the police officer says, well, Mr. Mr. Puddick has threatened all of these people. And the magistrate says, well, he's not charged with any threatening behaviour. Um, can you tell me what the nature of the threats are? And he sort of swerves the question and says, well, the threats were specific. They were targeted. They were directed. And the magistrate says, I understand all of that. Can you tell me what the threats are? He asks him two times, he swerves them again. The magistrate says, I'm feeling very threatened by Mr. Puddick now. I want a yes or no. Has Mr. Puddick threatened anybody with violence? Yes or no? Policeman says, no. <laughs> so, so he says, well, what can you, can you, what's this about? What's Mr. Puddick done that is so threatening that it doesn't involve violence? And he says, well, Mr. Puddick alleges that his partner had an affair with Mr. So-and-so that is vigorously denied. We have investigated. Remember, this is the counter-terrorism director. We're not talking about the parks police. We have thoroughly investigated it and found no evidence of an affair. Now, I've not been to court before, so I didn't know what it was all about. So I didn't know the court process, when you speak, when you don't speak. So I thought, resort to school, and I put my hand up. So I'm standing there like, like a prefect, not that I went to a, a prosh school. I put, put my hand up. And um, the magistrate addressed me and said, Mr. Puddock, and I said, could you ask um, Briars, Detective Constable Briars, in their thorough examination of, of this big case, could you ask them why they haven't interviewed my partner? And the magistrate looked at me and I said, and he turned around to, to Detective Constable Briars and said, he said, Con Detective Constable Briars, please, please tell me that you have interviewed Mr. Puddock's partner. He said, no, she's not a material witness. <laughs> I kid you not, I kid you not, I kid you not. As we left, um, as we left um, the court case, the, before, just before we left, the magistrate removed all the bowel conditions. We removed all, the, all of the bowel conditions. So I went in there with really severe stringent bowel conditions and I walked out with none. I was getting more and more angry at all this nonsense. I started to blog about it. I went to the press, but because it was the counter-terrorism directorate, and it's quite involved from what I've just told you so far, the press were, well, not sure where this is going to go. Would you believe me at this stage? It all sounds very fanciful, and I completely accept that. The, um, as we walked out of, the, that of that courtroom that day, the officer called me a W. I'll say no more than that, because he was angry. He'd gone in there, and he'd come out, lost all of the bowel conditions. Obviously, he's going to have to explain that to somebody. The chap that's bringing the charge against me, the chap that had the affair that completely denied it, the, the, we've got a counter-terrorism officer now on oath saying that there was no affair. To myself, I don't care about the affair. This is far more important because you're talking about your human rights. 
you're talking about your essential freedoms, and you're talking about the state getting involved in all this kind of nonsense. For what? And we're going to come to what that for what is shortly. So the case, the case against me, I've been brutalised, I've, I've been to court, um, I've been told in court that there was no affair, it's, it essentially it's all been made up. My wife is then interviewed and um, some police officers turn up from City of London Police at her office at the reinsurance company, a different part of it because she'd been moved by then because of my phone call to the chairman who kindly moved her. Police officers turn up and she's interviewed for an hour. She's interviewed for an hour um, in a glass office in the centre of the building. So there's people all around with two uniformed police officers. So um, I asked her to, um, to, make, to, to write, send an email to her HR department and make sure that's noted on her, on her HR file. Company turn around and say, look, nothing to do with us. If police officers turn up at the office and they want to interview you, we can't impede in their, in their, in their, in their, in their duty, so we have to allow them to do it. It's nothing to do with the company. They chose to come here. She said, well, I just want their names. And they said, well, we don't know anything about it. And uh, she said, but you were, you're the, the HR director, you, you were here. Um, you were there in the interview. She was nervous and scared and didn't make any notes and didn't, didn't, didn't write down their names. So she contacts City of London Police and said, look, this is a couple of days later, just had some of your officers down here. Can I get their names, please? No, no officers have attended. No, they have. They have. They were here for an hour. It wasn't like a five-minute misunderstanding, a, 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 a little conversation in a doorway, in a meeting for over an hour. And in the meeting, they suggested to her, they said, why would your husband make up an affair? And she said, no. And she told the truth, said there'd been an affair. And they said, no, we believe it's because your husband's a plumber, this chap's a, a multimillionaire, and he's jealous of his city status and his wealth. And she said, no, honestly, you should meet my husband. He really wouldn't be like that, which is true. <laughs> I promise. So, um, so um, I'm just trying to illustrate, because we're going to get to the big stuff soon. You think this is, this is all petty stuff, really. I'm going to get to the big stuff. So I'm just setting the, back, the background out. So anyway, the, the police have no record, the officers that attended have no record, the company has no record, they can't get involved because the police have just turned up. However, what's really, really interesting is later on we managed to get the emails and it was the company that had the, the relationship with the police and it's all done underhand. Now, how can a private American company, I'm not against companies, I run a company, I run a plumbing company, how can a private American company have a private police force? Now. We've got the biggest secret police force in the world in this country. Well, we'll, 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 take, we'll get to that. We'll get, we'll get, we'll get, to, we'll get to that. Nobody knows about it. So, um, anyway, um, so my, my um, partner then, my partner then um, it all came out with, that, with the HR about how this chap had been misusing his expenses, company expenses. Now, when you're on over a million pounds a year, you're paid to make the right judgments. It's about your integrity, yeah? However you look at it, rightly or wrongly, when you're in the financial industry making big decisions, uh, when you fiddle your expenses, there's a question mark over your integrity. So the company started an investigation into this chap's expenses, and after 34 years, the, at the beginning of the disciplinary process against him, he resigns. Case against me is dropped. You can't go to court now because of the expenses. It's gonna be very, very damaging. I'm dropped, free man, no pun intended. And I, um, I was just so angry at what the police had done to me, raided my home, raided my office. Um, they spent over a million pounds on Operation Bohan. Yeah, and is that there, raiding my Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna come to this, I'm gonna come to this with some of the pictures. This is, when I, when I was protesting about it, I'll go through some of the pictures and put it in some kind of context. So I'm a free man, it's all over. Uh, police have dropped the charge against me for making the phone call, it's all over. I'm so angry at the police. You know, most people will be upset about the affair. <laughs> Didn't have time for all that, well I did, but I was, I was more angry that the police would do what they did to me and brutalize me over all this nonsense. I, I, it was just, i had been brought up to be respectful of authority and not to almost in some occasions, not even question authority. So I just thought I'm not gonna let them get away with it. So what I did was, I then went on a, a little campaign. Case against me is dropped. I uh, went, uh, to, uh, went outside Parliament 
anyone seen the video of me outside Parliament, it's me just telling the story that I've just told you in obviously a little bit less detail. And at the end of the story, um, on the, of, of the video on the internet, I just say, if my partner had had an affair with the milkman and I telephoned the dairy and asked for her to be moved, would I be raided by the counter-terrorism directorate? It's a rhetorical question. We all know the answer. It's a massive abuse of power. Yeah? A massive, massive abuse of power. And I was not going to let them get away with it. I went to the press. The press were all, uh, we're not getting involved. I mean, I, never, I found myself in a whole world of pain that I didn't know existed. <laughs> so I, um, what I did was I tried to publicise it. Went to all the press. The press wouldn't touch it. I thought, how can I, how can I publicise this and get this into the public domain? Because this, one, should not be allowed to happen. Two, the people responsible for this should be accountable in the same way that they, threw the, they tried to throw the book at me. Or one policeman said, we, we taught you how to catch. And I, and I said, what does that mean? He said, well, he threw the book at you. <laughs> um, the, the, the resources that they chucked at me for, for, for a very minor petty matter, and yet these people can pull the strings, bring out millions of pounds, counter-terrorism director, over, over this nonsense, go, I mean, the policeman standing on his oath saying, no, there was no affair, we, we looked into it, it's definitely no affair, the guy's made it all up, he's jealous. I mean, when, when a policeman swears an oath, that oath has to have meaning. The minute they start lying and deceiving and, 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 and just coming out with all the nonsense that they come out with, one, they dishonour that oath, but they render the office of constable as meaningless. And it has to have meaning, just for all of, our, just for all of us. It just has to have some kind of meaning, if, if that makes sense. So this is, this is what I did to try and publicise it. Um, and by publicising it, I got raided again by the murder squad. <laughs> uh, not unreasonably, obviously. I'll show you some of the... Um, some of, the, some of the pictures. This is me. I'm a plumber. This is a solar. I just thought it was a nice, fun slide to start with, really. Uh, that's um, after installing a solar. I thought it'd be great to dress up as Darth Vader. Uh, why wouldn't you? Um, that's my plumbing company. We find leaks. Um, first thing I did was um, I've, never, I've never protested before and I've never voted. So whatever I say is, is, is not is not to have a political bias, well not indirectly or not consciously, maybe subconsciously some would, would argue. So what did I do? This was, um, this was in the summer of uh, 2010. Uh, Parliament Square is full of peace activists, anti-war, every flavour that you can imagine of activists, anarchists, they're all on there. Now I've never camped, <laughs> I've never done anything like this before, so I got a banner made up Went to uh, Millets, bought a cheap tent and all the bits. Friday night, I decided I'm going to get there. Get too scared, lose my bottle. Saturday, not a great day to start being a, an activist. Sunday, I thought, if I don't do it today, it's not going to happen. So Sunday lunchtime, I pull up in my car. I leave all my camping gear in the back of my car. Sunday, you can park around the back of Parliament. It's the only time you can park there. So I thought, what I'd do is I'll go and, I'll go and test the water. So I pull up to um, a, group, a group of peace activists who are all sat there. And um, you can see me in my jacket and jeans. That's normally how I, how, how I dress. And I said, look, I've come to a protest, but I don't know what to do. One of them told me to F off. <laughs> and then this little South African guy, Rob, um, who does little bits of work with us now uh, in my plumbing company, um, he said, look, come on. Uh, I, won't, I can't do his accent, but he said, come over and camp with me. So I went back to the car, he came with me, got all my gear, and he was really nice, he went and made me a cup of tea. And that was my first day, I'd been there for probably about half an hour there, looking smug, looking like I was physically doing something. The journalists would be coming around, and I was there for a, I was there for a while. Um, so that, that was my start of my little crusade to publicise it. I hadn't been re-arrested at this point. That's my tent, telling the story, one and a half million pounds worth of taxpayers' money, um, using counter-terrorism for what? Just for nothing really, or for nothing. These are my neighbours. Um, I don't know if any of you go camping my own. The only thing I would say that if you do go camping, don't camp next to anarchists. Um, they, don't, they, they sleep all day and they just make terrible noise at night. They don't play their guitars, they make loads of noise. Um, but they're all very, very nice. What was interesting, for the first few days, nobody would talk to me because they all thought I was an undercover cop trying to infiltrate them. <laughs> Prejudice is alive everywhere. <laughs> um, at this point, I'm re-arrested. I'm re-arrested. 
I've created my website, which I'm now trying to promote by my banner being there. I'm putting leaflet, handing out leaflets. I'm trying to just trying to publicise my case uh, in a way that the only way that I knew how via the internet and through word of mouth and through the anarchists. No, no, no. <laughs> I kept them well away. That was my view from my tent. I only put this in because it's just quite a nice picture, really. Literally, I'd open up my tent in the morning, and that was my view. Not many people get that view, so it's quite a nice one to share. Colonel Gaddafi's house, this is absolutely true. It's not a joke. That's Colonel Gaddafi's London house. He still owes us £400. We found a leak on his jacuzzi some time ago. I don't think we're going to be getting that. But that's genuinely his house. So I put, that's my website, policeexpenses.co.uk. Um, so I've been arrested. I've been re-arrested by the counter-terrorism police and the murder squad for creating that website. And I'm charged, the charge against me is this, because the people say, but what were you charged over? The charge against me was section two, non-violent harassment, creating an unlawful blog. And that's my blog, it's still there today. Uh, we'll get to the court case and what the police did in court and how they misbehaved. Now, the reason that they said the, the, the um, the reason that they said that the website was unlawful and they had to re-raid my home and my office again the second time was that the website that I created had har it was so harassing in its content that the chap that my wife had had the affair with was forced to resign due to my website. Now, he's not even in it. It's about the police. There's plenty of stuff about the police, trust me. But he doesn't, he's not named or mentioned once. But what they said was the effect that it had, because he knew he was involved, the effect that it had on him was so great he had to resign. What the police forgot was he resigned from his job when he was investigated over making fraudulent expense claims after 34 years. He, he resigned on the 22nd of February 2010. I created my blog in, in May, the end of May. <laughs> so even with the, number, the dates, they just couldn't stack up in court. So they were on a hide into nothing. Um, but anyway, they pursued it. They had nothing on me. That's all they could create. That's all they could create. And I steadily and steadily and steadily became more of a nuisance. And I believe rightly so. This is one of the brochures. This is one of the flyers that I would hand out. I then started going to Speaker's Corner. I was a regular speaker at Speaker's Corner every Sunday, hence the, ba the banner there. I went to Speaker's Corner every Sunday, even when it was raining because I was really sad. <laughs> and I had a big bee in my bonnet. Um, and that was my banner, um, what the police, basically a, a narrative of what the police had done to me. Uh, this guy here, um, you can't see him fortunately, he is, was a very, very senior policeman, retired policeman, um, and I was all a bit paranoid myself, but he was down with his family uh, from another part of the country, who was very, 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 very sympathetic, and uh, he actually ended up giving me lots of help, and at first I wasn't sure if he was really helping me, that makes sense? Because yeah, I just didn't know who to trust, I didn't know who to trust, like, it sounds paranoid, and there is some paranoia there, but with everything that they'd done to me, I didn't know, but he actually was really good, he was really, really good. And there are, some, there, are re there are lots of really good people there. You know, people say, oh, the whole world's bad and stuff, but, you know, eBay works because people are generally, not always, but generally, inherently good. Another, another picture there. These pictures, by the way, they're, they're not my, well, they've been given to me. There's a photographer who I'm sure is undercover police <laughs> who goes to the speaker's corner every Sunday just taking pictures of everybody. So um, I, I said to him, could I have all the pictures of me, please? And he went, yeah. So um, this is quite a good one. These are, these are delegates from the, these are family members that come over from China, from the Chinese embassy. And the um, ambassador's wife is just out of shot here. And what I was talking about was our essential freedoms, freedom of speech, freedom to communicate, freedom to impart information. And especially if what you say is, is true, it's said in a, in a, in a non-aggressive, non-threatening, constructive way, you should have a right to say anything, yeah? You know, if you're going, I'm gonna, and it's aggressive and you're threatening and you're whole demeanor, well, there are questions perhaps about that. But when what you say is true and said respectfully and constructively, you should have a right to say it. You shouldn't be arrested by the counter-terrorism squad. And I felt strong about it. And it was quite interesting getting these guys' views because they were saying, well, no, if the, police, if the police have said you can't say it, you can't say it. And these are young men and women from, from China. And it was the ambassador's wife that was saying that's crap. <laughs> I shouldn't say that, but she was really good. She was great. She's saying, no, it's essential. People have done, people have died. I don't need to teach you all this. People have died for our freedoms, haven't they? They've died for our freedoms. And, and there are so many people that will readily 
take them away very, very quickly. They don't do it overnight. What they do is they make small little legislative changes that chip away at our freedoms. So it is really, really important. As I said, I've never voted, but I felt so strongly at what they did to me. I was not going to let them get away with it. <laughs> it's quite an important one, that. It's one of, um, so, across, across London, the M25, over one weekend, 20, foot, 20 and 30 foot banners of my website went up. Some, some, very, some very, very helpful activists um, did that so along the, the North Circular, so I hear. Um, so we, we tried to publicise the website um, as directly as we could and in, each, in an enjoyable way, a non-threatening way, just to try and publicise it. Um, interestingly, the pictures you saw of me at Speaker's Corner, one of the times when I was re-arrested again for speaking at Speaker's Corner, they'd have, um, they'd have every flavour there. They'd have the EDL, you'd have, um, uh, you've had, you'd have all different forms of extremism, and people would get, not violent, but they would shout and they'd be very, very aggressive in, in what they were saying. And there's me very peacefully handing out brochures saying, I'm going to court, I've been charged with creating this website, please support me. <laughs> Everything I say is true, I have a right to say it. And the police would arrest me. <laughs> the police would arrest me. It's really funny. It's really funny. Um, what, um, what they would do, they would send undercover officers, um, these are counter-terrorist officers from the City of London Police. Um, Speaker's Corner is, in, is out of their jurisdiction. It's in the Metropolitan Police area, Hyde Park in central London. So on a Sunday they would send officers in undercover and I'd have a big crowd and I'd be talking to them and then occasionally you'd have someone say, what's this bloke's name this is all about? I said, no, it's got nothing to do with him. It's about what the police did in his name. It's what the police did. Yeah, but who is he? What's his name? And I never mentioned his name because it's not about him. It's, not, it's all about what the police did. Yeah? The police swear an oath to uphold the law. We don't. Um, and, and they dishonour it when they lie and cheat and do all these kind of things. My first court case, um, there's a few there. We went to, Star we went to Starbucks, um, we went to Starbucks um, afterwards and I got everyone a coffee and some cakes. Um, it's one of my plumbing vans. <laughs> See someone sat on the toilet there. <laughs> I just, as I said, we try, we spend so much time at work. Uh, we, it's important that it's just a nice, pleasant place to work really, if that makes sense. I think that, that's, 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 it, that's it for my pictures. So we get, to, we, get to, uh, we get to my trial, and I'm charged now with using, uh, publicising my website. The actual charges for, for creating um, this website. Um, I borrow some money, um, I borrow quite a bit of money, and um, I get a great QC. I get one of the best in the UK. In fact, he's been voted Britain's best cross-examiner. Crown court or magistrate? No, magistrate's court. Couldn't go, we, we couldn't get it into a crown court. It's such a low-level offence. Um, I, tried, I tried prior to that, actually. Um, I mean, I was so, obviously, I could tell I was, I was furious at what they'd done. And people were saying to me, you can get it transferred to the Crown Court if you change, try and change the, the jurisdiction in the court to a common law jurisdiction. I tried all that. I ended up, I, I mean, as I ended up trying to ask the judge if he was on his oath um, so that I could try and um, ascertain some control in the court, looking at the jurisdiction, making sure that it's a common law jurisdiction, and exercising my rights to, to, a, to a trial by jury. I did try that. Uh, the judge threatened me. The judge said, if you don't stand in that dock now in five minutes, I'll have you thrown in there. And I said very respectfully, you don't have to threaten me. I'm not violent. I'm asking a lawful question in a very peaceful way. I'm not a lawyer. I'm a plumber. And I, I, just, want to, I just want this to be fair. That's all I'm asking. And he said, if you're not in there in five minutes, you'll be thrown in there and the security were there. And I thought, if they have to touch me and manhandle me into the dock, that will be reported. Anyone that knows me knows that I would never cause any fights and trouble. That just wouldn't happen. However, it would be reported that there was a breach of peace in court. I'd struggled and was aggressive and all that kind of stuff. And that's how it would be reported. And I was not going to allow that to happen. So I did, went into the dock. Uh, the judge came back in. Um, I said, I apologise, I'm just trying to ask, you know, I apologise, I'm not trying to cause any problems, I just want to make sure my rights are enshrined. Um, obviously, just <laughs> crushed them. <laughs> I just completely crushed them. Um, at that point, that's when I decided that I was going to get the best lawyer that I could, and some friends, um, some friends and customers, believe it or not, customers, 
um, didn't want me to go to prison. Um, the police were pushing for a, 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 a minor custodial sentence of sort of three to six months inside for this. Um, so um, I was going to fight it all the way. There's no way I was going to, to let them get there. Barrister was great. Barrister, one of, well, Britain, uh, Michael Wolkind, QC, Britain's best cross-examiner at the bar. Um, he said that we all, um, that, that they, they disclosed the evidence against you and you get a chance to, to defend it in court. He, he, I mean, he's, um, he, he's on the camera, he's on, he's on the new video, and he just says that if he'd gone in front of a jury, it would have been laughed out of court. But unfortunately, he didn't have that luxury, and the, the, it's not as fair. You go in front of a magistrate or a district judge, as in my case, it's generally not that fair. So he said that what, we, what we'll do is we won't, um, we won't give them um, a, a full defence case statement. So the CPS came back to us and said, we want you to disclose all the areas that you're going to defend. Obviously, you don't say what you're going to say. You leave that for court. Um, he said, no, we won't do that. We don't have to do it. We won't do it. So obviously, there's some big reputations here, some big, big reputations here. So my house is then broken into, and all my court defence documents are stolen from my house. Oh, no. Yeah. Um, this is not the police. This is, um, this is the power of big private security companies and reputations in the city of London at the highest level. As I said, if we take this analogy to its, uh, to its logical conclusion, if we were talking about the dairy, well, we wouldn't even be talking about it because I wouldn't be here today. This would never have happened if I'd made that call to the dairy. But because it is a large American corporation, a company called Guy Carpenter, who employed the services of Kroll, who had contacts with the city of London police uh, and made it all happen, they need to know what's going to come out in court because their reputations are on the line. And so they need, a they need a conviction because then it legitimizes everything they've said and it justifies the police. The police, the police won't say, you know, if they spend millions of pounds um, harassing me, when they get a conviction, what price do you put on upholding the law? So it's, it's all very, very, very corrupt. <laughs> we then managed to get all the emails from Kroll, the private security company, and the police to show that how it was happening. And we, in court, we were able to prove, and my, or very, very skillfully in court, that the whole prosecution was being guided by a, a private security company from America. Over, I mean, that shouldn't happen, should it? Shouldn't happen. To illustrate um, the lengths that they went to, uh, the police brought in a, um, an IT forensic uh, professional, a guy called Matt Mansell, who is the managing director of a company called Monster Domains. And he writes a, a report against my website. He, um, my website is ianpuddick.com, which is my name. But when I publicized it, let's be frank, if you saw a banner up on the wall saying ianpuddick.com, would you look at it? No. So what I did was I bought the domain name policeexpenses.co.uk because it's, if you saw that, got a better chance that you might be a bit interested. And if you go on that, it just diverts through to through my website. So uh, Matt Mansell gave a very, very detailed report on my website. He, to be fair to, to Mr. Mansell, he never at any point says that I did anything wrong. But what he does is, through the use of language, suggests how it's possible to take, I don't know, an IP address and hide it under here and cloak it with this and change it to this and do this and do that. Now we get Again, we have to go to the expense of employing um, a, a proper IT forensic guy, a guy called Ron Cuffley, ex-military ex, uh, intelligence, ex-police intelligence. He's retired. He still does work for um, all of these sort of security services now. And he was so appalled at what they'd done. Um, he, he, he did it all at a discount for us because he was so appalled at what they'd done. So when we get to court, this uh, Matt Mansell gets up for an hour and a half and gives an hour and a half. And if you just listened to him, I promise you, you would have been convinced I'd done something wrong. You, you just listen, if you'd listened to him, you would have thought, well, I've, I've done something anyway. I've definitely done something. He's then cross-examined and my uh, barrister says, have you read our expert witness? No, police didn't show it to him. We disclosed that. Police didn't show it to him because it was in their interest to show it to him. <laughs> Um, the judge calls for a recess for half an hour while he reads our expert report. And my barrister says to him, have you read it? Do you understand it? Yes. He says, I've got one question for you. Does anything in your expert report apply to Mr. Puddock's website? I want a yes or no answer. No. <laughs> Go on. Right. Detective, Detective Sarah Mayo stands up in court and says, my website 
Harris, Mr. Hain, sorry, ha Harris this chap into um, having to resign from his job. It harassed him so much. After 34 years, um, he had to resign. My barrister pulls out um, the information regarding uh, when the website was set up, and this chap had resigned six, approximately six and a half weeks before my website was, was ever built. So there's no way that it could have harassed him into resigning. And then what my barrister did, which was absolutely fantastic, because this chap had been, um, because this chap had been investigated by the company for fiddling his expenses, the one person that knew that, who authorised it, was the chairman, a guy called Nick Franklin. So my barrister gets a witness summons on Nick Franklin. Now, we cannot have, if you think about this from their perspective, I thought it was great personally, but Guy Carpenter, the reinsurance company, cannot have the chairman of the world's biggest reinsurance company in court over this petty matter saying, yes, our group managing director did fiddle his expenses, because then, it, and he's a board member, this other chap. So it puts a big question mark over the whole board and their integrity. It couldn't happen, it couldn't happen. So my barrister said, we'll do a deal if you confirm in writing that Mr. So-and-so had, had been investigated for fiddling his expenses, there was disciplinary proceedings starting against him because there was enough evidence for that to happen, um, that would be fine. So we got that in writing. So pull out the letter, confirming from the company lawyers, and the officer in charge had confirmed that there, he, this, this chap was never investigated, she'd investigated it, He'd never, there was no disciplinary, there was never any uh, investigation about his expenses. And we said, well, the company's actually told us that themselves. So, he, so, so um, Detective Sarah Mayo then said, but Mr. Puddick, and this was reported widely, it was in every newspaper for three days. It was breaking news on Sky when I was cleared. And the, pa the papers got it all completely wrong. The, um, Sarah Mayo, the officer in charge, then turned around and said, yeah, but Mr. Puddock has put thousands of messages on Twitter, on Facebook, on, on the web, all about this chap. But thousands, thousands. My barrister, have you actually, he said, in the interest of time, have you actually seen any of these messages? No. Have you seen any evidence? Did you bring any evidence to court? Did you present any evidence prior to court about this? No. Have you ever seen any tweets, any Facebook entries, any blogs all about this chap? No. But you just said under oath that he put thousands, well, he's got a Twitter account and a Facebook account, and we believe it was his intention to do that. That's exactly what she said, I promise you. I promise you. So this is the evidence, this is the evidence um, against me. I get to obviously speak and I tell my story. I tell it in the, best, in, in, in the best detail that I possibly can to make sure that these people do not get away with it. And I tell the story about how Detective Sergeant John Ellis and Colin Dawson took me through at that earlier stage into that room and brutalised me. Colin Dawson said nothing. Um, he couldn't remember anything. And the other officer, I mean, they're just, they're just, complete, they're just completely corrupt cops. So I, I, give this I give this example and I said to the judge, this is what co has compelled me to do this. If they can brutalise me, they can do this to anyone. Now, John Ellis wasn't involved because that was the first case that was dropped against me because obviously he'd lost his job for fiddling his expenses, so it was all dropped against me. So the judge was appalled at what I'd said, and I went into detail, I used the language and how they were screaming in my face and the things that they were saying, and I unfortunately had to use the swear words that they were, they were using against me. So the judge said, I want the proceedings to stop, I want those two officers here within the hour. I want, sorry, I want the three officers. I want Briars, the officer at the first, at the first hearing said there was no affair, they'd thoroughly, under oath, she's, um, you said there was no affair, and I, you know, what's counter-terrorism officers getting involved in all this nonsense for, saying there's no affair, lying under oath, for such stupid things, they shouldn't be lying anyway. Um, and then the two officers that took me through to that room. So there's an hour, an hour goes by, they're brought back in. Um, Ellis is questioned, first of all. Um, sorry, uh, Colin Dawson comes in, first of all. Colin Dawson is the, the officer that came through to that room. My barrister is firing questions at him. Can't, all he's just can't remember, can't, he was very ups, he was very nervous, it was all, you know, it was all this. Um, can't remember, can't remember, can't remember, can't remember, can't remember, can't remember. Just had no recollection of anything, just couldn't remember a thing. He wasn't going to drop his mates in it. Bri Briars comes in and he hasn't got too much recollection of telling the magistrates anything, he can't remember most of it. He pulls some notes out, gives a slightly different tale, doesn't, doesn't say any of the, any, when he's questioned about uh, lying under oath, 
He has no recollection of any of that. And then my barrister says, uh, when did you make your, your notes? When did you write your notes? And it was over a year later. It was over a year later when he was investigated by the IPCC for, for that. Um, this is the interesting one now. Uh, this is the interesting one now. Ellis comes in, very, very cocky, very, very self-assured. And he tells the magistrates, there's a couple of, my barrister says, how many, how many officers are raiding Mr. Puddick's house? <coughs> Due to the passage of time, he can't remember. He's in charge of this, but there are uh, a few officers. So my barrister starts building the numbers up and we get up to about seven. The judge then chips in. He said, but she, she said, but you just said there was only a few officers. How many, how many were there? Does that include the officers that, this, that the barristers just mentioned? Anyway, we get it right up. The numbers are up. And then my barrister says, how many are simultaneously raiding Mr. Puddick's office? Don't know. I wasn't there. He said, but one of two things happened that morning. You, as the officer in charge, told them to raid the plumbing company. Or they woke up that morning and thought, oh, this, what should we do? Or we'll go and randomly raid a plumbing company. How many, what was it? Did you tell them or did they, did they turn up randomly? I told them. How many were there? Don't know. Don't know. We got that up to eight. How, uh, my barrister says, okay, there was a simultaneous raid at Mr. Puddick's accountants. Did you instruct them? Don't know. So they just turned up randomly at, a, 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 at a, an accountant's office. No, I sent them there. How many there? I think it was three or four that, that were there. So we've gone from him coming in to contain it all, you know, there's me making this huge fuss about this big raid, it's just a couple of officers, bang. Mr. So he says, when you searched Mr. Uh, Puddick's property, what did you find? He said, we found uh, uh, crack cocaine paraphernalia. Now that's serious. Now we're ser that's serious. Under oath. He says, under oath. It's under oath. My barrister looks at me, I'm in the dock going. So uh, my barrister very, very skillfully says, can you tell us about the search procedure? And he says, yeah, we're in teams. One officer finds, another one bags, another one tags, another one collates, and he goes through the search procedure. And he said, are you with those officers at all times? He said, yes. He said, okay, and what did you take from Mr. Puddock's property? And he said, we took his mobile phone, his satellite navigation system, his uh, computers, laptop, same from my office. He said, what did you do? And he said, we took everything, bagged it all up, and we sent it to the high-tech crimes laboratory for forensic analysis. Remember, you're paying for all this. <laughs> you're paying for all this. Um, so he said, okay, and he, did you, when you've got the, 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 the Tom Tom and the, the computers, when you eventually got it all back, did you find anything there of any criminal activity? No. They went through my VAT as well, by the way. We believe there's a reference in one of the emails to the Economic Crimes Unit, and we believe that they, they, they also went through all my VAT records just to see, well, we get him on his VAT after, you know, we, you know so anything, anything, anything they can get me on. And, and we're paying for all this, all this rubbish. And he said, right, come, come back to the crack cocaine. He said, um, my barrister said, well, really, where, where did you find it? And he said, we found it in the kitchen, in the bedroom, and in the loft room. And my barrister said, well, it's really a cache of crack cocaine. So he said, yeah. And you're thinking, yeah, great. You know, we got him. It's credited him now. So uh, he said, obviously, um, you, you, um, you confiscated that with the Tom Tom, didn't you? You, com you confiscated it. No. You, you discussed it with the other officers, though, didn't you? No. But they were with you. You said they were with you when you searched all times. Oh, I can't remember. Well, have you discussed it with them or you didn't? No. He said, but you made it in your notes, obviously. You made a note. You have to make notes. You made notes, didn't you? No. He said, tell me. This is my barrister. You told me. He said, tell me. You've got, you rung your boss, though, and said, we've, we've cracked it. We've got a cache of crack cocaine paraphernalia. You, you made that call, didn't you? No. He said, so as of today, two years later, it's been going for two years. I've been arrested loads of times in between for, for, for talking about it and publicising it. Um, all that. Under oath. This is counter-terrorism officers. The guys that are meant to help us sleep safely at night, keep us, keep us, keep us, for, for, for just pulling in favours, covering, covering for each other. Now, I'm not anti-police. As I said, I'm, I, can, I can't emphasise this enough. Throughout this, I've been helped by so many, so, and I never mention their names because I wouldn't want to get them in trouble. But um, I would, um, the police, a lot, lots of very good police have helped me. So I was, I, was, I was just saying that we've been helped, but I've personally been helped by so many senior officers, including a couple of chief constables, who were just truly appalled, just truly appalled. Uh, one officer, after the first time I'd been arrested, uh, one officer um, got to see the interview, and he said, you won't be charged. He said, you will not be charged. You haven't committed any offence. 
this is back in relation to the, to the charge concerning my website. He said, you won't be charged. I said, well, they, they keep, they, they, they're definitely going to charge. They'll find somebody to charge me. And he said, look, if I used my weight, my position, and leaned on the CPS and said, I want this guy charged with something, if I used my weight, I could probably force it through. He said, what I would, would I want to be associated with all this rubbish, for want of a better word? He said, not in a million years. You will not be charged. So I bet him a Big Mac that I would be. He still owes me a Big Mac. <laughs> but um, as you can see, I'll... Um, but, but coming back, so we, we, got, we got progressively through the, we got through the trial. Um, the actual charge of creating a website that would harass this guy into resignation, well, that couldn't, sta that couldn't stand because he'd resigned six weeks before the website was built. So that was, that was thrown out. Uh, all the forensic stuff, well, the forensic investigator for the police, Matt Mansell, said nothing that he said applied to me. Uh, the police officer... Um, lied about uh, the, the drugs, made that up to discredit me. He was completely discredited. Uh, Sarah Mayo, the officer, said, I put thousands of messages on Facebook and Twitter, but then said, actually, she'd never seen any, but she believed it was my intention to. Well, that, that didn't hold any weight. And what was really interesting was my barrister forced her. I mean, she tried everything to wriggle out of answering the question. He, he got her into a corner where he kept saying to her, you have denied my client, Ian Puddock, his lawful common law rights and she tried everything to worm out of it and in the end and this was my defense by the way through in my case you know when you go I say it like a know all when, when you um, when you go to court obviously you have a defense and under statute law that could be another case you could say well in another case blah 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 which is similar to mine and you can use that case to argue your case well we didn't do any of that we used the common law defense of reasonableness would the average man on the street look at what all the things they'd done to me and say that I behave reasonably, yes or no? And that was my defence. And he, um, Michael Wolkine QC got, got Sarah Mayo into a corner and said, as a, as a, as a counter-terrorism officer, or as any police officer would apply equally, you have a lawful duty to offer a common law defence of reasonableness to anyone. And look at the alleged crime, look at the person's behaviour, have they behaved reasonably? If they have, then no offence has been committed. Did you offer myself the common law defence of reasonableness, which was what we used in court? And, in, and she tried everything to not answer the question. And in the end she said no. And he said, so you effectively denied, and you spent all these millions of pounds, when, some, when a common law defence of reasonable, reasonableness would have been suffice, and she had to admit that she did deny me my common law rights. So now in the process of, of suing the police. Um, what have I done since? Obviously it was, a, a, it was a, a landmark victory for freedom of speech. It's been debated in Parliament. Um, the police have um, all freedom of information requests pertain, pertaining to cost. The police have said, but well, due to all the police cuts, the cost of them looking at the cost of the operation to keep on arresting me and harassing me would be so great it would be disproportionate for them to, to release the money so they can't see how much it cost. The, um, the, um, great, some good news, very, very recently, there's a new TV show that hasn't started yet, but, um, I believe it's going to be on ITV. It's called I Want to Meet. And what they want to do is get two controversial figures to come and debate a subject without them being politicians, and mine's going to be the pilot for the show. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go on ITV, and you've got Adrian Leppard, the, ch the commissioner of City of London Police that authorised all this nonsense, and I'm going to debate this case with him. Now, as we understand it at the moment, he's declining to go on TV. Now, as a public servant, as a public servant, he has a duty of care and a responsibility to be accountable. Let's see if he's accountable. Any questions? <laughs> just, sorry. Well, um, the final words, accountability, unfortunately, from listening to what, to what, what you've said, uh, you appear to have caught the City of London Police at it. Like you wouldn't believe. Yeah. Unfortunately, what's happening in the regions is far, far worse. It is being covered up. Well, plenty of victims out there. It, there are. I mean, I promise you, I get e e emails. We get emails every day at my, at my office. Um, people, we've, people ringing up, asking for advice. Like, I mean, I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. 
or, or any of these things. I just knew what they did to me was wrong and I wasn't going to let them get away with it. That was it. Um, it um, but uh, there's, there's, ter uh, there's things that I hear that are far worse than what I've gone through. Um, but no one should have to be arrested regularly by, by, you know, by counter-terrorist police for this rubbish. Um, absolutely not. If you have a look on my, um, if you have a look on my website, Chris Plumley, Channel 4 Dispatches, is now investigating it. And he's made a short sort of 10, 12 minute, I think you've seen it, haven't you, Dwayne? Yeah. Um, short 10, 12 minute uh, program on my, I've put it on my website, which is like a little trailer, which should be out, the full documentary should be out later this year. And they've got the estimates of the whole operation into millions, into millions. I mean, they, they, don't, they don't mess around. But to, to get it into the public domain is near on impossible. And you pick, you, ring up, you, read, you pick up newspapers and you read stories about people rescuing cats and stuff from trees. And you, think, and you think, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, do you feel, um, it, it's a bit like a controversial comment in a way, did, did, did you feel threatened um, at, at times? When they broke into my house. Really no, I, 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 felt, I felt threatened, I felt genuinely threatened on two occasions when they took me through to that room and I've sat there on this chair that was fixed to the floor and he's screaming in my face, effing and blinding, I could smell his cigarettes breath in my face and he's accusing me, all that kind of stuff. I, I didn't know about the law, I don't know what the police can do, what they can't do, but I just knew it was wrong. I just knew, as a public servant, that was wrong. I felt threatened then, and when they broke into my house and stole all my court defence documents, that was a message to me, because um, uh, Ron Cuffley, for example, the forensics uh, intelligence officer that helped us throughout our case, he said, if they were going to do a professional job, they would have been in your place, they would have scanned all your documents, they would have gone, you would never have known they'd been there. They wanted to send a powerful message to you that we, you know, your, if your house is open game to complete strangers, nothing is. That's the only other time I felt very, very threatened. And it just spurred me on to, 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 to not let them get away with it, to but be honest were with you. you at a police station? Sorry? You were at a police station? The first time I was in a police station, yeah. Where was the room that they were? Down, down, downstairs. Downstairs um, in so a back room. Have been a police sergeant up at the yeah, but no, they all colluded. No one could remember anything. All the CCTV got wiped uh, when they investigated it. Yeah. Yeah, CCV all got wiped. How many of the officers who've lied and conducted themselves like that have subsequently lost their jobs? None, none at all, none at all, none at all. When the, um, to, to be fair, I tell you one of the questions I get asked a lot, and to be fair, I, 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 well, I'm, I'm personally quite happy with the answer that I give. People always say to me, hang on, he was, when we came out of court that day when the, uh, Ellis had lied uh, about brutalising me and then about the, 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 the crack cocaine paraphernalia, and it was absolutely blatant because he was absolutely annihilated by my barrister. And my barrister came out and said, I won't say, well, I won't say what he said. <laughs> Called him a lion, so-and-so. Um, I, I said, well, why didn't the judge do something? Why didn't the judge say, hang on, this guy's clearly lying on his own. Why didn't the judge do something? And the answer I was given, which I do accept, by the way, is when you go to court, people do tell lies, they do bend the truth, they do do, do this. If the judge, in any case, was to say, Stop, you've just told a lie. Hang on, let's stop the trial. You've just told a lie. He's not told a lie. It would just be chaos. The judge listens to it all to get it over and done with. And then if there's any further representations about people lying, it can be addressed. But people don't, people don't follow them up. People don't do what I did. They don't go to Hyde Park. They don't, they don't, I'm not suggesting they all should do that. But you know, if it's really important to you, um, I would suggest that to anybody that they should, if that makes sense. Derek, Derek, it's Derek now. Ian, um... I just want to thank you on the behalf please address, of... Excuse me, Derek, would you please mind addressing your questions to me, please? Derek, come on. Um, Ian, I just want to thank you on the behalf of the general public. You've um, stood up to be counted. It takes a lot of guts to do that. I didn't feel I had any choice, but thank you very much. Thank you. Um, wife and I have uh, tried to stand up and be counted, but uh, um, you end up, on many occasions, being pointed at as being a bit of an idiot or a or a, a you do, yeah. fool for what, what you're doing. But um, that I know when we lived in Wales, I can remember saying there was a hell of a lot of apathy in Wales, and um, our campaign has been, been against the health authority. Yeah, so I was saying. And um, we've also been involved with the police as well. Yeah. South Wales but we've also, what we've said is that um, there's a hell of a lot of apathy out there, 
And if you could put VAT on apathy, um, <laughs> it would cover the cost of the health service. Yeah, in a way. yeah. But it takes a lot of courage and gets to do what you've done. And thank you very well, much. Well, uh, thank you. It's very kind of you. Thank you. Pe people just. Thank you. I'd like to uh, just say one thing. Sure. I have a little girl and she went to the monument one time. When children go up the monument, they give the children a certificate and the monument is inside the city. Yeah. And in the small print on this certificate that this, they give the children, it says, <coughs> we, the inhabitants of the city of London, are unaccountable, untouchable to anybody. We are a law unto ourselves and we are, cannot be touched. Words to that effect is on a children's certificate when you go up and down the morning. Incredible. So are the police? Well, the police are effectively oh, above the law. Now. Yeah. Mm. Just, to, just to remind that there's lots of good ones. They're not all bad, obviously. No, no, no they're not. They're officially above the law. They are not above the law. No, no, no. Nobody's above the law, but they well, behave the IPCC is run by a retired police officers. The, the IPCC is the defender, biggest joke no. going. Um, if, if we get to do this live, if we get to do this debate on, I, on ITV, I will be... That, that, that will be a huge, that will be a huge focus of my attention. It's a joke. It's an absolute Guarantee joke. Guarantee one thing, you won't be allowed to say one word against the judiciary. Um, uh, do you know what? Well, we'll see. We'll see. I, I don't see how that would be a problem. The judge dismissed the charges against me, so, I, I mean, I was, uh, to be fair, <laughs> I was crying so much when, um, when, the, uh, when the case was over and she dismissed the charges and threw it out. Um, the security guard opened the door to the dock, but I was, I, I, I was just so emotional, I couldn't move, to be honest with you. I was just so pleased it was all over. I was so pleased. And, and really, the, for me, the, the closure that was going to come, really, when I win the trial, hopefully win the trial, and that would be it. But it continued in the trial because they were lying. And I just thought, no, no, they're not going to let them get away with it. Well, we're doing that now. We're starting that now. Yeah, he's only going to ask how you ran your company in power. Um, well, the, the, the truth is, um, I'll say this on camera, uh, we lost, uh, my turnover of my business dropped by just within 12 months. Um, I'm not obviously a working plumber anymore. I'm not out there banging, I'm not out there on the tools. My job is to make the phones ring, to keep the work coming in, to keep the company functioning, if that makes sense. Because obviously if the phones don't ring, there's no plumbing jobs, we, 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 you know, it's, it'll be, we, we, we wouldn't be around for very long. Um, so all the marketing that I was doing, I didn't stop it, but it was all ad hoc. Um, so the turnover of my, uh, my, my business dropped uh, by just over half a million quid um, to, uh, within, within that period. I didn't let anyone go because it's not their fault. You know, what, you know married, people with mortgages and kids, it's not their fault that I'm out camping. I mean, we make jokes of it because it's funny now and it's, it's funny to, humorous to see the pictures. But it was incredibly serious. I wasn't going to let anybody go. And I, I just kept borrowing money uh, to keep things going. Um, I said I borrowed money from friends who trust me and, you know, I always kept my promises. Um, and the bank, really, I mean, I, I know the banks get a kicking. Um, we, we, made a, we made a big loss last year. And we're just doing our accounts this year now, the end of this month, a couple of weeks' time. So we've turned around last year's loss and made a small profit. So the bank's happy. But the bank, the bank kept me going through this. I have to say, if the bank didn't, I wouldn't be here. Well, I say I wouldn't be here, but um, I wouldn't have had a company and everyone would have been made redundant. So, so there's, a, it's a, there's a happy tale to it. But I am suing the police now. Uh, there will be a private prosecution against the police for perverting the course of justice, amongst many, many other things. The fact that um, you're suing the police, will the RPC be forced to have an inquiry into the officers who lied in court? Well, what, what will happen? Um, based on the police officers that I've been speaking to, they'll all retire on full pensions. They'll go sick before it, before it starts. They'll go sick. This, I mean, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Uh, before the inquiry physically starts, they'll get the nod that this is happening. They'll suddenly go sick. The minute they go sick, they're untouchable, and then they get pensioned off. But they are. Um, they're very, very rarely do police officers prosecute. If you see in the news that a police officer has been prosecuted, they would have done almost everything. Because what the, 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 the uh, Peter Farhi Who's the, who's the chief constable at ACPO, the Association of Police Constables. Um, he was on Panorama, and he said on Panorama about police corruption, the public do not want the, the police to be prosecuted 
because of the expense, the public don't want all the money wasted, the lengthy investigations. So they just, they just, they do some really bad things. They just either resign or they get pensioned off. So they are effectively above the, the law. It's outrageous. It's absolutely disgusting. Yeah. Yeah. In the Daily Mail a couple of years ago when Sir Ian Blair was the uh, head, there was a particular article, I can't remember the number, it was 254, 64 met police officers all with convictions against them. Yeah. So going back to uh, 07 hour, 274 still employed convictions for rape, theft, burglary, drugs, the lot. Oh. 260 <coughs> plus met Officers. I've got, um, it's, well, I, I mean, I've, I've got a huge following on Twitter. I think this morning it was up to about 64,000. And all I do, all I do is tweet on, pub, on police corruption. And because of my case, I built up a really good network and relationship with all the journalists. And they, 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 they literally text me, as a text message, little stories about police corruption that are being covered up that they're not allowed to print. And I tweet them out. Um, and people follow me because of, because of, and it's all police corruption. And I have to say, 85% of the tweets are my own. They're from journalists. I don't sit there all day. I'm trying to build my business up. Um, so, but at least, but I do put it out there. Chris, um, the, the media, uh, we know that the media are muzzled and have always been muzzled. And there must have been a lot of people in the media like the police who want to tell the truth. Yeah, so, sure, that's true. It's very unusual that they might get an outlet through someone like yourself. Well, the, 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 um, I mean, the, to be, I don't know, I don't know enough about the media. I know how it works. They're very generally, journalists are very lazy. They're inundated with stories all day long. There's no shortage of news stories. They don't want to know. But they don't want to know anything that's going to be no, a bit complicated, no. take time. They're very, very lazy. Um, you know, in my, my case, all they wanted was all the salacious stuff about the affair and all that. Missed the point, you know, missed the point. But the, the, the tide is changing with Leveson. I know there's lots of issues about, you know, people talk about Leveson. But it's, it's fairly public in terms of, if you look at the language that's used, up until three weeks ago, they were just saying journalists bribed uh, public officials. They never said police. They always said public officials, meaning the police. It's a very nice way of saying police corruption. Now, it's, they talk about police corruption openly. So it's slowly, slowly changing. And whereas, you know, you know, the boys in blue are always seen to be, you know, generally, you know, beyond reproach. Well, we, we know that's not true. You know, that's not true. We've been involved with many. Yeah. <laughs> we've been involved with many investigative journalists. And they say they can spend a long time on getting everything perfect For nothing. to get it published. But the problem is, it gets to the editor. The editor may okay it, but then it goes to the legal department. And once it goes to the legal department, yes. you're in, involved with the old boy network, yeah. and it's not published. And that's how exactly how yeah. it works. Ja Jamie Dowd, who's the Home Affairs Editor at The Observer, said to me, you know, do you think it's the Masons? Do you think it's the Masons? Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> old boys. Well, well, to be fair, the old, the old boys club, the old golf club, the old school tie, the Masons, whatever. The, the reality is, though, you're never going to prove it. So I never say, yeah, it's this or it's that, because I don't know. It's going to be something like that, of course. It'll be something like that, but the bottom line is, you know, um, people say, yeah, um, the, oh, by the way, the, the ITV, when they were looking at this um, new show, they said, you need to get Kroll in there, because Kroll, the private security company, Benedict Hamilton, the guy who rung you up and said, we're going to F you, and then um, pulled in all these favours. And I said, no, 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 they're not the culprits. Kroll, Kroll misbehave, and they will long continue to do that. Uh, way, before, you know, way beyond my life on this planet. The issue is the police are meant to be beyond reproach. Yeah. They're meant to be above all this rubbish. And it's them as public servants to protect us. So um, we'll see if we get Adrian Leppard on the TV. It's been, it's been to call. Cool. It's been to call. Cool. the case. She said, I couldn't, we couldn't possibly uh, uh, finish well, it. And then she said, and you'd have a libel case against you as well. And so I had to change it to, um, in, in uh, put it, uh, plumber, 
uh, plumber to Colonel Qaddafi. Plumber, plumber to, uh, <laughs> why he had to blow his whistle. Yeah. That was what I put in the mention. Yeah. Um, Mark, she took I, that. I would I, point out that if the echo thinks something is even remotely contentious, or they don't like the sound of what you're advertising to be a group, they will stop it because, as, as you know, I help run an Earth Mysteries group, and we have some interesting title subjects. And if they're, let's just say, they're extreme or they're contentious, the echo will change them to something that will not give effects. We won't get half the bums on seats. Like, let's just say UFOs land, landed in, at Stonehenge um, with visual proof. Say that's our headline. They will just say, um, are there UFOs? Do they visit the Earth? So anything to, to stop it, to stop it coming. Yeah. Well, Can I, I make one? I phoned Brian Garishel and I told him, Brian said, what? He said, right, he said, we'll make a case of it. He said, we'll publish it. We'll publish it anywhere. I suppose that is. That night, that if they published, um, if Brian published it, uh, the echo would never take anything, any advert from me again. So I didn't sort of put <laughs> to do anything. One, one, one final note, which is um, a, a ray of hope, really, for, for, for freedom of speech. Um, the pressure is going to start mounting at some point on Adrian Leppard, City of London Police to come on TV and debate this. I've obviously agreed to do it. He's obviously going to keep declining. And everyone's heard of Mac, Max Clifford, the, the PR guy. Yeah. Well, the, the number two PR guy company, uh, company in the UK is a company, a company named after a guy called Mark Bukowski. He does big stuff. He's looking, you know, Julian Assange, yeah. uh, WikiLeaks. Mm -hmm. He's representing Julian Assange. He's, there with, he's up there with the gods. I spoke to Mark Bukowski this morning. And he said, what we'll do is we're going to start a national media campaign to get this guy, Adrian Leppard, on the TV as a public servant to be accountable for all this nonsense. So we'll see where it goes. Is he the chief Above that is the commissioner. Oh, he's the He authorised it all. He's the commissioner of the city of London. Only city on this. Not the Met, because people always refer to my story of the Met. Can I mention that contentious issue that Dave mentioned about the Met? Contentious issue there is that the Echo won't, won't publish anything to do with the Intercase, which is, uh, drags down the police. Yeah. You know, if they're the guy who's beat the police, they won't do it because it infused the police here as well. Yeah, clearly. Yeah. Yeah. Thousands of people. I, I, it's amazing how many police officers follow me on Twitter. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Is your, Ian, is your television program going to delay? Which one? The debate? Yeah. The, debate the debate won't be live, no. Yeah. It won't be. Yeah. But I've been, I've been I've, no, no, but I've been, no. Well, I've been assured that as long as what I say is true mm. and proven in court and I can back up, which I can, yeah. that's it. So it will be contentious, it will be embarrassing. Yeah. Um, let's see if he stands up and takes the, takes the challenge. So okay. who triggered this off? Ian, when you made a phone call... The private security company, Kroll. They used their contacts. Someone must have contacted them to say... Yeah, yeah the, re the, reinsur the reinsurance company, the guy that had the affair. So it all comes back from... Yeah, him. oh yeah, oh yeah. The business for everybody. <laughs> Did he get any flash back for the backlash of failure? Did he know he got a massive payoff and went to be a vice president elsewhere. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. You have to respect the system sometimes. It's amazing that police could find so much money yeah. to do what they did to you. Yeah. Well, they tried. Um, they tried uh, because because this guy. I'll tell you this only because it's a small inconsequential, but it, it will show the veracity of the police in terms of what they tried to do to me. They tried to. They didn't. They, to be fair, they didn't. But they tried really hard to prove that I'd committed fraud. And the fraud was, my domain name, ianpuddick.com, which I'd hope you, when, you, when you've got five minutes, do go and have a look at my website. If you look at my website, ianpuddick.com, obviously I bought that domain name for £7.90. I bought it on my company MasterCard. And they said that was fraud. They said that because they said it's not a legitimate business expense. And I said it is because I'm trying to divert my, I'm constantly being arrested by the counter-terrorism squad and I don't want my company to be too affected by this. So you want to keep coming after me, that's fine. That's, but my company, Leakbusters, the plumbing company, I don't want that to be involved. So this is a legitimate business expense, £7.90, to protect my company. 
They said it wasn't, and then they took advice, and then they said, oh, maybe it was. But they tried. They, they arrested me and questioned me about that. About that. Did they ever try and attack your psychiatry or mental? No, people have asked me that lots of times. No, not that I know of. I need to, I need to grind me down. Well, the smears. Yeah, my, yeah, well, there were smears. So who, who made the smears? I don't know. Uh, my accountant got an anonymous call. He made, a statement to, he made a statement for the court. My accountant got an anonymous call saying that I uh, was uh, an undeclared bankrupt and I'd gone bankrupt. Uh, obviously, that's not true. Some of my suppliers, obviously, you can't target my, cu my customers because my customers are the public. So when the phone rings in the office, I don't know whether it's Mrs. Smith or Mr. Jones. We don't know. So you can't target them. So some of my suppliers all got anonymous calls saying, Leapbusters are just about to go bust. You know, get your money in now. Um, and my accountant was told that I was a convicted drug dealer. My accountant. He got an anonymous call one evening. He made a statement. He, he was contacted and said, did you know that the managing director of Leapbusters is a convicted drug dealer? So, yeah, but it's just... I don't believe the police were behind that. I believe that the private security company was. So the whole cocaine thing was them really pushing their luck and not hoping. It's just to to, just to spin me. No. no. Because the minute it was challenged, they had absolutely not backed themselves up at all. No. no. So they must have been very confident that it would never get that far. Well, to be fair, if you were there in the court, the um, um, Sergeant John Ellis when he brought that up, he was getting absolutely slaughtered by my barrister. And he goes, and he's just like, well, we, 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 we found a cache of crack cocaine. Oh, really? Yeah, he we found it. He never recorded it. He never backed himself up. No. How stupid is that? No. Honestly, the whole thing was stupid. The whole thing was stupid. Yeah, at what point did you get your computers and all the stuff that was seized? Did you get them returned? Six months, over six months later. And then I was scared to use it in case they planted stuff on it. But by that point, I'd already bought other stuff to keep my business going. The, the computers aren't expensive. You can buy computers for 200, 300 pounds. It's the data, the information on them that crippled my business. But obviously, they don't care about that. Yeah. Yeah. Was that through your first getting it back? No, they had to, they had to return it. Yeah. That's something else, though, that you can claim expenses against for. We're suing them. We're taking a civil action against them now, so yeah. yeah. So loss of earnings could be massive. Yeah. yeah. When do you think this will come up? This case? The, the, um, well, the, the, civil, the civil proceedings will start in the next three months, within three months, within three months. Um, the documentary for uh, the, the Chris Plummy's Channel 4 Dispatches documentary will be out later this year. A lot of that's going to be rolled around the, 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 the court case. And then the documentary... Um, the PR guy, uh, Mark Bukowski, rang me this morning and said, have you heard from your lawyers? Because they want to tie it in so that you know, if, if they can get it in before my court case, anything that helps you know, promote the court case. Because the police need to be held to account. I'm not above the law, nor are they. Nor are they. they think they are. Uh, where would the court be? It would be in, uh, be in um, the Royal Courts of Justice in London. Oh, it would be, be big, yeah. In Crown Court. I'll be blogging it, trust me. <laughs> Thank you ever so much for all your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.